So y equals x squared plus 1. What does the graph look like? Probably shifted up 1 through that. Okay. What about y equals x plus 1? Okay, line with slope of 1 and y-intercept of 1. So it looks like that. Um, the question is, what the region look like? The intersection might help us a little bit. To find the intersections of the region, we need to set the equations equal. Uh, the ones drop out, and we get x squared minus x equals 0. It factors into x times x minus 1, which tells us the intersect at 0 and 1. All right. Okay, so that about jives with what my picture looks like. Now we're revolving that region around the x-axis. If I revolve it around the x-axis, will I be using a x as the variable of integration or y? x. If I use x, then does the rectangle go this way or this way? The first way, okay? So we're going to take a slice this way and revolve it around the x-axis. So we would have a, a collection like that. And if I join it, like that. Now, part of the hard part now is that you have two different figures, discs and washers. And the question is usually, at least it was in my mind, well, how do you know when, which one you're getting? Well, the picture kind of rules it, but the idea is if the region is right up against the axis of symmetry, then when you revolve it, it'll be a solid disk, no hole in the middle. But if the region is above the axis of symmetry and there's a gap, then when you revolve it, there'll be a hole and you'll get a wash. In this case, am I getting a disk or a washer? A washer, all right. So I hopefully you have the basics down that it's big R squared minus little r squared in a washer case, and the height is dx or dy, but in this case we said because it's around x we're using dx, all right? And the hard part is, all right, well I know it's a washer, I got the basic gist of the integral. What's big R, what's little r? Big R is what? It's the, yeah, it's the distance to the line. Big R is all the way out to the outer edge, and at the outer edge is the line. So big R is the line. Little r is the radius of the inner circle that's being subtracted. In the inner circle, we're going to the parabola. So little r is the parabola. And the limits of integration are 0 to 1. You may use your calculator then to evaluate that. Although, please tell me so, we could have done that by hand, but let's, in the interest of time, let's move on. What do you have for me? Three decimals or more. Well, somebody shout out their answer. Be bold enough to just shout out so they can move on with their life. One, four, four, one, four, six. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. Do we all agree? All right, cool. Uh, 14 is rational functions, which we did in set 8. Uh, this requires a little bit of practice. It'll take a while. Uh, so we're supposed to graph this thing. Uh, we could do all the normal stuff first, like the holes and the x-intercepts and the vertical asymptotes. So uh, we might want to factor this first. How does the numerator factor? plus 3 and x minus 2. Do I have any holes in this problem? No, there's no common factor, so there's no hole. What do the top zeros indicate in the graph? 
Zero. So we have zeros at negative three. Did you say zero? Oh, yes, you're right. That was a dumb question. Okay. <laughs> the top zeros indicate zeros or x-intercepts, I guess is what I was thinking. Uh, what about the denominator zeros? What do they mean graphically? Vertical asymptote at one. All right. Now then, this is where the new stuff starts to take place. The end behavior, if I were to take a limit on this, as x gets large, they both get large, but which gets large faster, the top or the bottom? The top, and so the top would win, so this would go to infinity. If it goes to infinity, now the question is, all right, now I have to go more and say, how does it go to infinity? You can't just say, oh, it follows y equals x. That's not the slant asymptote. You have to divide. In this case, we could synthetically divide. If I divide the denominator into the numerator, then synthetic looks like that. All right. Now, what that really means is the equivalent form of this is x plus 2 minus 4 over x minus 1 is the remainder. And all that's great, but I don't particularly care about the remainder. As x gets large, the remainder approaches 0, and our graph approaches y equals x plus 2. So this part is the part that's interesting to me. y equals x plus 2 is the slant. I, would, I think that's part of the problem. And if you, in the homework, you fail to show the work to find the slant, to me, that's an incomplete problem. And I will look to take off there. So please, on these problems, show the work to find the slant asymptote. That's part of the problem. If y equals x plus 2 is the slant, then the graph will also follow this path. Now, in terms of signs, I'm sign testing the factored form of the graph. Left of negative 3, like a negative 5, I'd be negative, 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 which is negative. Now, if the graph is negative, but it's got to follow the slant asymptote, then follow the slant asymptote below the axis until it comes up to that x-intercept, in which case it might change signs. We'll see. Now, by the way, remember that slant asymptote. I say it's the whole thing, but really it's just a guide for the outside. So don't sweat the inside of the slant asymptote. It's, it's just a guide for end behavior. It's not a guide or a fence for the inside of the graph. So don't sweat that, right? Um, what about between 3 and 1 is the next region? From negative 3, sorry, negative 3 is what I meant to say. Negative 3 to 1, negative 0. What are the signs? Positive. Negative, negative, which is positive. Okay, so it's got to go positive. And then what does it do as it gets closer and closer to that one? It's a vertical asymptote. Can I cross through a vertical asymptote? No, it's undefined there. Should I cross down? No, for two reasons, that's a no. First of all, it's supposed to be positive for this whole interval, so it cannot be negative. Second, there is no zero there, so it definitely can't cross down. It's got to go up, okay? Now, the next region is from one to two. One and a half, maybe. Positive, negative, positive. What negative is? Negative. You with me? Now, if it's negative, it's below the axis, and it's got to follow the vertical asymptote, so... Following the vertical asymptote below the axis would be this way. And it's going to come up until it hits that x-intercept. Then, from 2 to infinity, like at 7 or 100, positive, positive, positive. Y is positive. So what does the graph do? Go up and follow the slant asymptote. Okay. That's what you're looking at. Is that uh, making progress or still a long way to go? Still a long way to go. Okay, so be it. Uh, that's a false slide there. Uh, the notes. Differentiability and continuity. Do I have the right notes for you? Yes. Okay. Uh, this has some real softies, and that's good. These are pretty common. They'll usually have one, a soft multiple choice in here. Um, it'll be a layup, so hopefully that'll be the case. The hard ones are pretty... 
I can comment on the free response, but it's my job to prepare you for all cases, so we'll do focus on the easy ones, but we'll also prepare on the hard ones. So differentiability, as you might think, is the ability to take the derivative. Some cases we talked about, you cannot take the derivative. These are the three cases for no derivative. If there's a discontinuity, no derivative. If there's a sharp turn, no derivative. Or if there's a vertical tangent, no derivative. Now, this one is one you'll have to often prove that a sharp turn derivative doesn't exist. That's the hard type. We'll get to that in the back side. For now, though, if you have any of those cases, um, then that'll be a no derivative -y kind of case. So, given this bad boy, look at this case here. At what point or points is the function continuous? but not differentiable. x equals negative 2, I heard. Is it continuous then? It's not continuous, so not negative 2. Next thing that's interesting is negative 1. Is it continuous then? But is it differentiable then? No. no. So x equals negative 1. It's continuous, but there's a sharp turn there, so it's not differentiable. The derivative doesn't exist. What else? Zero, yeah, x equals zero, there's a sharp turn there. x equals zero is a no because the vertical tangent. Please don't confuse vertical tangent with vertical asymptote. Vertical tangent means the curve is there, it just goes vertical. Vertical asymptote means it's not continuous there, there's no, there's no curve there, all right? Uh, how about one, is it cool at one? Yeah, that's a smooth turn. If I zoomed in on that, that would be locally linear, no big deal there. Uh, what about at 2? It's not continuous, so that is a no. So it feels like it's just a, you know, you with me? All right, go to the next one. At what x value or values is the function not differentiable? Now, that's not the same question. I know it feels like it's the same question, but it's not. Give me all x's in this region. It's not not differentiable. Negative 2, because there's discontinuity. Negative 1 and 0, because we just... Already knew those. What else? Two. And two because there's a discontinuity. Okay. At what point is the function differentiable but not continuous? And you would say none. That is not possible. Um, it can't. If it's if it's differentiable, it must be continuous. I think I'm a visual person. So if you were to show the relationship of continuity to differentiability, continuity is the big boy. Differentiability is the more precise condition. You could be continuous, but not differentiable, like at a sharp turn. But you could never be differentiable and also and not be continuous. It just can't happen. Right? Differentiability is the best I can find. You with me? All right. Um, give this one a go. This one, uh, I put, it was on an AP test a couple years ago, then it was released, so uh, it's good practice. So give this one a go. I think I got it. There's a lot of lot going on through my noggin. I don't know about you. Do you have so many thoughts going on through your noggin or just total blank going on through your noggin? Are you still working? <coughs> okay. Uh, give me something. Give me something you thought. Doesn't have to be the answer. Just tell me something you know. What? 
a test. Okay, when so when this passes through the x-axis, what must be happening? If f prime is zero, f must be. You're doing well. Come on. No, no, no. If the derivative is zero, that doesn't mean f is zero. It means f is flat. The derivative is the slope. If the slope is zero, the graph is flat. All right. So it must be flat at one and five and three. This is flat at one and three and five. This is flat at one and three and five. This is flat at one and three and five, but this is not flat at three, so that's ah, so that's probably we're good. What else? Give me something else you know. You can actually learn something by speaking. Yes. F prime. Say that again. The values of f prime have positive and negative. Okay. So when f prime is negative, f must be decreasing. Increasing, 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 decreasing. So it should only be decreasing on 0 to 1 and 5 to infinity, yeah? This is increasing on 0 to 1, decreasing on 0 to 1 and 5 to infinity, so that feels good. This is decreasing on 0 to 1, but this is also decreasing somewhere else. This cannot be. It's not decreasing in the right place. This is decreasing on 0 to 1 and 5 to infinity. This is good. So now we've got it down to A and C. Let's go more. Um, these, so these have the same shape. And this is, the, this is a well-constructed problem. I don't know if you appreciate how cool this is. But this is linear, right? If this is linear, then the antiderivative must be parabola, yeah? So parabola... This is parabola, so the antiderivative is probably q. And this is linear, so the, the negative slope, so this is probably that way, yeah? That's why these shapes are being used. Parabola, cube, parabola. Makes sense. Which one is it? A or C? Why is it? Because what? <laughs> non max, good idea. Continuous, that's about it, okay? Do you agree that the derivative exists there? Now, I'm not saying take the derivative of this, because, yeah, I know that's a sharp turn. I'm talking there's a point there. f prime at 2 exists. And f prime at 2 can exist unless f is continuous. It's got to be a continuous thing. It's got to be. So it's got to be linear. Okay? A lot of thought to that. Um, let's go on to the medium level difficulty. Um, this is also a very common mis common problem. So they give you a function that's piecewise. And they say one part is parabola, one part is line. And they want at 2 for it to be continuous and differentiable. Now imagine that here. Here's 3x squared, and here's ax plus b. Uh, it could look like any kind of line, yeah? Now, 3x squared would have to, first of all, hand off to the line in such a way that they meet at 2. They couldn't be kind of this thing totally separate. So continuous, they have to meet. But differentiable means the slopes have to perfectly match so that it can't be a sharp turn there. This would have to have just the right slope so that the slope smoothly transitions into the other. Right? So that's really hard to achieve. Work with it this way. Continuity implies the functions or the limits of the functions must be equal. We know that the definition of continuity says from the left and the right must be the same. That would imply continuity then. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left, which uses which of the two branches? Left is less than 2. Less than 2 is 3x squared. Needs to equal what the function approaches from the right. Right is above 2. That's above 2. That's x plus b. 
Now, if I evaluate each limit at 2, I get 12 needs to equal x is 2, 2a plus b. At that point, it's kind of stuck because that's two variables and only one equation, right? Thankfully, however, we also have differentiability. Differentiability implies that the derivative from the left and the derivative from the right have to be equal as well. The slopes have to match. That then would mean a second limit to be done. What's the derivative from the left? What's the function left of 2? Straight squared. What's the derivative of that function? 6x. Okay. What's the derivative of the function on the right of 2? A. The limit of x goes to 2 on the right side is just straight up A. All right, now, what's then the left-hand side? What's As x goes to 2, 6x, or the slope on the left would approach 12. That parabola is ending off at a slope of 12. So I need A to be 12, for the line slope to be 12, so it's smoothly transitioning, no sharp turns. If A is 12, then that implies that 12 equals 2 times 12 plus B, so B is... Well, all right, so you work with limit statements and continuity, limit statements and differentiability. Try one on your own, please. Tempting for students to not write the limits and just work with a uh, bunch of numbers and x. I, I do not get full credit for that. You'll get some credit, but not full credit. To be honest with you. You set the functions equal to each other in the limits and get that a equals negative 2 plus b by continuity. Did you set the derivatives equal to each other in limits and get that negative 2a equals uh, positive 2, so a is negative 1. And if a is negative 1, then b is. Okay? All right. Um, try this multiple choice question, please.
Yes? Which choice? A, B, C, D, or E? It is A. Okay? Tempting for students to say, oh, I plugged in zero or two and I got zero, zero, no limit, boom, pop, good. Uh, so some people scratch A, but surely the limit of zero over zero does not mean it doesn't exist. It just means it goes further. And there is a limit. The limit is four. Now that's a whole. And the limit of 4 means the y value when x is 2 wants to be 4. The question then is, did they fill the hole? They said to find the point at 2 to be 1. Well, that means there's a point there. Did they fill the hole? They did not. Therefore, it's not continuous. And if it's not continuous, it cannot be differentiable. And therefore, it is A. The limit exists, but that is A. Understood? All right. Here we go then with the craziest one. Uh, this is not say the derivative doesn't exist. It's prove the derivative doesn't exist. You will definitely please write this down to remind you this is the alternate definition of the derivative. Use. You will want to use this in a case like that. There are three definitions of derivatives. This is by far the friendliest for this kind of problem. I'll show you why. Okay? We know the derivative of the absolute value doesn't exist at x equal 2 because there's a sharp turn. Uh, it's proved the derivative doesn't exist by using the definition of the derivative. Now, this then is the definition of the derivative. The derivative at 2, by alternate definition, is the limit as, oops, this is not x, oh yeah, as x goes to, what in this case, 2 of f of x minus f of a over, or f at 2 in this case, right, 2 over x minus 2. And mind you, that's saying basically take any point x and draw the slope between x and 2. And what is the slope as x gets closer and closer? Well, it kind of depends on if x is on the left or the right. When you draw the slope, you get can get two totally different results. And that's why the sharp turn is an issue. Right? Now, here's the thing. To prove this doesn't exist, now you're going to go left and right hand. The limit from the left of f of x, which is x minus 2 minus, what is f of 2? What's f of 2? Put 2 in the next one. 0, put 2, over x minus 2. Um, Let's see what that comes out to be. Now, limit as x goes to 2. You've done this a million times, but this looks familiar, but it's not really true. As x goes to 2 from below, say 1.9. What's the absolute value of 1.9 minus 2? What's, what's 1.9 minus 2? Negative 0.1. The absolute value of which is 0.1. The bottom is negative 0.1, so this slope approaches negative 1. Now that makes sense, too, because the slope on that side is negative 1. Okay? The slope on the right side, though, same problem, but on the right side, at 2.1, instead of above, below 2, I'm going above 2, what's the absolute value of 2.1 minus 2 over 2.1 minus 2? 1. Now, if the limit from the left and the right, by definition, are different, the limit doesn't exist, and so because those derivatives from each side don't equal each other, f prime at 2 cannot exist. It is the limit, and the limit doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist. All right. Now then, would you try this one to the best of your ability on your own? And we'll see. Uh, I 
I don't ask, you don't need to show that it's continuous. I'll tell you it is continuous. Just tell me, show me it's not differentiable. Absolutely. Uh, continuity we could do by showing the functions are equal. But you're using the definition of the derivatives here. Show the original. Actually, this to me is the derivative. That form is this. Yes. So to answer your question, yes. You should start by saying the derivative of four is boom alternate definition. Then left hand right hand limits. On the left hand side, what's f of x? X squared plus two. What's f of four? f at 4 is this function, and that's 18, yes? Yes, right? Do you agree? Okay, minus 18 over x minus 4. That, as we clean this up a little, is x squared minus 16 over x minus 4. What are the slopes from the left to the right? What does that equal? Jeez, this is just really killing me today. Do you agree it's 0 over 0? So you have to do more. What's the limit? 8. The slopes from the left are 8. Do they match the slopes from the right? A. Let's see. What's the function on the right? 4x plus 2. F at 4. It's still 18 minus 4. If I clean that up, the limit of x goes to 4 to the right of 4x minus 16 over x minus 4 is x minus 4 divides away, leaving you with 4. 4 is not equal to 8, and therefore f prime at 4 does not exist. That's what the work should look like. People who are too smart for your own good, I will warn you. If you're sitting there thinking, that's so much work, I have a way easier way. This, say, hey, the derivative here is 2x at 4, that's 8. And the derivative here is 4, that's not 8. That will give you zero. That is not a proof. Sorry. This is not the definition of derivative. You would get nothing. You might as well just write, I have no idea. Because that's what you'll get the same thing. Okay? It is a proof. You will use the definition of the derivative or you're wasting your time. Um... For a proof problem. If it says prove or show, that's what you got to do. On the previous problems where it's just multiple choice, uh, it's not required. Um, what is this? This is something from last year, not this. All right, questions on. Uh, I must have done extra practice last year. Huh. Um, is that 81 volumes way back on Monday? Yes. They will, they will say, if it says prove, um, there were, so in the last 16 years, there, this question has appeared maybe three times. And one of the times it just says prove. And you, it was on you to know the definition of derivative. The other two times it said use the definition of derivative to prove that prime does not exist. Uh, in those cases, they, they give you that. Um, thankfully, they're not every year or definitely on there. It's, it's more true. Okay. Um...
Yeah. I got I to be 100% honest with you, okay? Uh, there are some things I teach you that I'm basically teaching you for the, the people that are at just A level killing it, okay? Um, and then there are some things that I think, all right, uh, the people that are just barely struggling to make it, maybe not so important. Now, this, this, if you're just barely struggling with me, then don't sweat this, okay? This is not going to be something you're getting probably your attention. Let's just be honest. Um, if you're barely struggling to make it, you should be just killing, take the derivative of this, find the integral of that. You should be, you can get a five on the AP test by just killing technique and doing practice. And you cannot, you can miss the gotcha problem and still get a five. No problem, okay? But I, I feel like I, I don't want to confuse you, so I hesitate to put stuff like this on my notes and ask you about this stuff. But to be fair to those people who are going to just top flight colleges, I mean, if you're going to Rice or Mines or something, this is that's the level you're expected to know. It's that that hot, and I would be doing people a disservice if I didn't say it. So, um, if you're just kind of hanging on and calc isn't your thing, and just trying to get some college credit, um, don't sweat this too much, okay? Um, let's go to questions on anyone. Three, you say. What? Ten? Ten? Twenty-two. Twenty-five. Alrighty. Okay. Um, boom. By the way, if you, even if you're kind of iffy, but you like calculus, don't give up on it. Make it your thing. You might have to work harder. I know I did. I didn't understand everything like these freaking BC things can do. I had to work my part off, but it came to the next couple. Um, 81 3. Are we ready? 81 3 is. It's not a place, is it? No. All right. This one is often hard to start. F is a quadratic function. That's a very subtle starting place. What's a general form of a quadratic? Yeah. So the intention, I think, is that you right away say, all right, this kind of problem, I need A, B, and C to nail it down. I would need to be given some stuff. Slope of the tangent at 1 is 1. Slope of the tangent at 1 is 1. is equal to or the same as being given f prime at 1 is and so yeah you might be saying all right i'm going to need the derivative good morning dublin jaguar please rise to the pledge of allegiance So, if I use this as a derivative, then that gives me the fact that 1 equals 2a plus 2. The next thing they tell you is the tangent at 2 is 5. F prime at 2 is 5. So, 5 equals 4a plus 2. Right? Uh, the graph passes through the point zero one. Zero one is a point on the original, so that implies that one equals zero plus zero plus c. So c is one. Yeah. All right. So we know c is one, and we could use those two to find a and b by elimination. Yeah. If I take equation two and subtract away equation one. 5 minus 1 is 4, 4a minus 2a is 2a, and the b's drop out, so a is 2, and if a is 2, then b is 3 is 3, yeah? Uh, 10, question number 10. Activity. This will be for girls. 
So this is one of the new ones, the slam action quick fix, okay? Start. Start by, it doesn't factor. The fact the top is always odds that it has no zeros. It only has a vertical action for the zero, yeah? Are you with me? No zeros. Now, this overall, has a power of x squared over x, so it's an x-ish power. Use n behavior. It's got a slant. Find the slant, you divide. Depending on the equation, you might divide one of three ways. In this case, the easiest way is just to put each individually over x. So, if you split this, it becomes this, and as time goes on, the remainder goes to zero. So y equals one half x is the slant. So it's got a slant like that. You follow? Sign wise, we're talking about positive over negative. So it's got to be negative on the left side of the graph. Right, if you follow the asymptotes, it's got to look like that. And this is positive over positive. Uh, room for girls so is that here or here? The top one or the bottom one? Uh, yeah, the top one is the only one that can be this. It's not a function. It can't be that. So you're right. It is the top one. Okay. 22? Oh, that was hard one. This one requires you to do some interpreting. If it has parallel to the x-axis, then it has two horizontal tangents. If it has two horizontal tangents, then that means y double equals zero at two points. Uh, not y double, y prime. Right. The derivative is 4x squared plus 4kx plus 5, yeah? This is supposed to have two zeros. Now, here's the theoretical or hard part. This is a quadratic, and it's only going to have two real solutions under certain quadratic formula conditions. This has two solutions if, when we go to solve this, if this part is positive, so you need to set set b squared minus 4ac greater than zero and solve. Okay, that should get you going on that one. And sorry, I didn't hear that one. Okay, have a great day. Swing by if you have other questions. Seventh period or after school.